Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One, a series of programs of timely and timeless concerns on which we talk to accomplished women from many walks of life. I'm pleased to welcome singer, actress, and writer Melissa Errico to the program. At age 46, she's been blessed with steady work on Broadway and off-Broadway, on television and in the movies. But in a New York Times article last year, she decried the fact that women in theater tend to be segregated into playing either romantic innocents or worldly dames. Why can't a 46-year-old actress be able to play both, as well as something in between? Which is exactly what she's done. She recently starred as Sharon in the Irish Rep Theater Company's production of Finian's Rainbow to glowing reviews. And she'll talk to us about being an actress, a wife, a mother, a concert performer, and how she manages to stay grounded in a turbulent time. Welcome. Thank you. Melissa, there are lots of aspiring actors who can sing, dance, act. But it seems to me that when it comes to Broadway musical, um, having the right look for a particular role is especially important. If you don't have that look, you know, despite your other talents, you don't get that part, no matter how talented you are. I, I think about Elaine Stritch talking about moving to New York, wanting to be an actress, and it seemed like she got an acting job almost immediately. Uh, not that she wasn't talented, but she was also young and blonde and slim and pretty. She had the look they were looking for. Uh, is this still true? Um, I think there are people who really change that um, s slightly. I would say Audrey McDonald is a perfect example. She came right out, she was a peer of mine, and came right out and played Carrie Pipperidge in Carousel and did a remarkable job. Um, I think there are really special, special, unique, unusual talent, um, talented, talent, talent or talented people like her that can bust out. But I think the, the majority of actors are, are, are offered this sort of paradigm, this you must fit into this. But then there are the Kristen Chenoweths and the Audra McDonalds who are just so uniquely wonderful and mm -hmm. different and bold that they do bust out of it. So it's, I think there's always room for a miracle. And I think Elaine Stritch is kind of a unique character as well. Mm -hmm. As pretty and blonde as she was, she's a f pistol, right? Right, I mean, she's, right. <laughs> she's Elaine Stritch. Right. I have a great story about her when I played the Carlisle. I mean, you just never, you never forget her energy. Even if she's in the audience, you can't get your you eyes off her. I mean, right, right, right. <laughs> um, so You're there right. are unique people who can bust out. But okay. yes, there, there is this structure that actors are presented with. And if you're a leading man, you have to look a certain way. Absolutely. Yeah, but I still yeah. don't want to be disheartening to people out there who are a little different or, or you know, I don't want to say that this whole thing is, is like making, you know, Valentine's Day cookies and you have this little form and you make hearts and everybody has to look like a heart and then it all goes in the box. Um, it, I, I hope that that's not always the it's, it definitely isn't always the case but the business does present us with these with these cookie right. cutters and I right. think it's for actors to squish up and break those and say no but yes we are presented with this task of looking a certain way which I did and when I came up in the late 80s I actually was pulled out of a hallway I was auditioning for I was a, I was a Yale student I had just begun my freshman year and I started to audition right away during freshman year I took my little Honda which I had earned beyond some um, soap operas, and I took my little Honda back and forth to New York, and right away, though I loved being in college, I was thinking I had early summer, and I wanted to be in a musical, and I started auditioning for summer stock and driving back and forth to Manhattan, auditioning for Rhode Island's Theater by the Sea, just based on my physical appearance, I was seen by the director of Les Mis, Curls, he saw Curls, he saw Victorian Curls and a certain kind of face. Cosette. Cosette. Okay. He pulled me out of the audition, literally opened the door, and I had tap shoes on, and said, can I see this girl for Les Mis? And the Rhode Island Theater by the Sea people, I, I, didn't, I, I bumped into them once along these 30 years, and they went, oh, we knew, <laughs> we knew we were sunk, we knew we were gone. And I had tap shoes, it changed into little shoes, and it wasn't short, so I went and auditioned for Cosette, mm -hmm. and I got the job on the spot. And you were in college then? I was a freshman at Yale. Oh, wow. And I, did, I dropped out for a while. You played a lot of what you call ingen go back. <laughs> ingenue roles. <laughs> This, what describe the ingenue? Well, the ingenue is just what I'm describing. It was that girl in the hall with the little curls and the little round face. Uh, the ingenue is, is a, an ingenue is a is a is a literary type, I guess. Um, it's definitely a theatrical type. Um, she's the she's young. The ingenue means young and innocent. Usually young and innocent. Yeah, you should. 
I mean, yeah, people nowadays are always making ingenues a bit worldly, but I, that's, that's not right, actually. She, she, you, also, you also wrote that the ingenue tends to fall in love instantly. Oh, yes. Oh, of course. Sight. It's always love at first sight. Okay. Yeah, there's a kind of trust. I think the essence of the ingenue is a, nat a, a nature of trust, which I still possess even in my old age. Um, I've always had like an open face, and I feel um, idealistic um, always about my encounters with people. So an ingenue would look and meet someone and say hi. Like they're not going to be like hi, like ever. So is that why um, you got to play the role of Sharon in Phineas Rainbow for the fourth time <laughs> just recently? Because you're still an I still have a youthful, yes, maybe. I'm not a, to I'm not a completely jaded uh, wreck of an actress yet, you know. <laughs> so I, I, I was offered the part of, of Sharon. Did I answer your question about what an I ingenue is? Yeah, she's, she's yeah. innocent. She's usually quite, you know, she's usually, you know, pretty or whatever, but like pretty in the sort of like simple way, not sexy pretty. Right. Not, and not extraordinary pretty. Sort of, in, there's got to be an element of, of kind of sim simpleness about her. It's mm -hmm. not like, a, these are not the, the real, like, you know, women with great shape and interesting nose and big eyes and stuff. That's not the ingenue usually. The ingenue is quite, you know, um, conventional. Right. Um, you know, like a, like a doll, just like conventional and easy on the eye. and. So it's not always a compliment to, to fit the mold. But, but you said um, uh, Broadway actresses or musical theater actresses are often um, <clears throat> pegged as either ingenues or as worldly dames. Well, is that's, that's are there, the, are there par Is that because there are no parts in between? In the middle. Nobody really cares about women in the middle. Like, they don't write about women in the middle. You know, the women in the middle are what? Married 10 years, um, 20 years kids are growing up, they're starting to, to wonder about changes in their lives or the nature of their own friendships, the nature of their, uh, the way their marriages have been designed. You know, there's so many interesting things that go on in a woman's mind and life. Um, but musical theater doesn't, doesn't develop that much. Maybe there's an auntie character somewhere, somebody's aunt who lives next door or something or comes wandering into the plot and says three things and leaves. But there's no play about the right. psychology of a woman my own. You're either actual, Sharon or your auntie Mame. Yeah, or right. you're just angry as just the Jesus, you know, like Gypsy or something, right. or you know, right. Sweeney Todd, and you're cooking right. people, you know. Now, you <laughs> came from a, a rather artistic family. Your father was an orthopedic surgeon. Your mother is a sculptor. Your grandmother was an opera singer. How did you get into acting, singing, dancing, and did your parents support it? Oh, yes. I, I mean, I almost think that it's uh, my, I mean... I'm, you know, I'm an actor, so I'm always in analysis of some kind. Um, and I, I've, oh, I've given some thought to this. I mean, I don't even know that I'm, my, my life as a child is separable from creativity. And uh, m my parents were always so excited. What a play are you in? Tell, tell us more, you know. Um, and uh, the singing and dancing was so rewarded. Um, my father's a concert pianist. Oh, okay. Um, in fact, I was, saw him yesterday, and uh, I came by um, their apartment. He was like, he, op he had opened the door, interacted with me a bit, but he was practicing. So I was like, okay. And he, he was like, he's in his 70s, and he was like, hi, hi, nice to see you. How are you? Okay, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm practicing. And he turns around and goes right back to the piano. My father, my whole life was, and actually then I went on to hear him playing Poulenc, the most beautiful Poulenc. He studies at Juilliard still. He's a serious musician. So music is in my father's bones, but he was... Uh, from an immigrant Italian family, as was my mother, and a life of music and creativity was a risk that neither of them were willing to take. My mother's a sculptor, my dad's a musician, but they uh, were too concerned about, uh, I don't know, it's not really so much failure as it is, it's just not a sensible thing to do with your Did life. Did your mother work? My mother was a school, a school teacher in Harlem, oh, okay. yeah, until um, my, we were s small, and when, when, once my brother, then I, needed her and then she had my sister so then she was she, okay. she stayed at home but she was a sculptor my father and mother didn't do uh, creative things and I think once they saw it happening in their children my brother was a guitar player and a singer songwriter and I an actress the rewards were pouring at us and th the joy that they took in plays and seeing me in costumes and auditioning for things or doing school plays I can't even say it was like their own cup was runneth over so I did sort of I've, I've, I've written about this before I wrote a one woman show uh, uh, at the public um, in November of 2015, and I, I did write that there was a ventriloquism between my mother and I, that in a way she was ah, yes. singing through me. Ah, yes. So you got this role um, with, as Colette without even auditioning. Oh, for Cosette. It. 
No, I auditioned. No, I went in. I he brought me. The, okay. The, I was brought. I was actually sort of stolen from one audition to another. I and see. And my it was only saying that based on what you were saying about what an ingenue looks right. like, it's so it's so identifiable just on the surface. Right. That they said, could you come in and audition? Then I auditioned for Cosette. But you and went, I got it. But you got right into the theater. You I did. Have, yeah. I did, and that's has its own. In retrospect, it has its. There are hard things about going straight to work and not um, working your way in. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I've actually taken about the last 10, 15 years to re-evaluate the f good fortune I had when I was young, and to kind of re-earn my stripes. I really think that that's important for us in all at all points in our life to sort of um, go back to re. Just re, just re, rebuild your. Uh, I mean, in some cases, rebuild relationships. People that I had met young, and I, um, you know, been wor working so fast, and you know, I didn't even get to know them well enough. Now I've gotten to know them. So what? So all oh, right. So in 1997, you write. So you were the arranger of that show, and like I, sometimes there are people that when you're so busy and have so much pressure on you, you don't even get to know people in the same way you would if you had moved slowly up and right. into your field. Right. So. Um, so yeah, so I, I did get a lot of work young, and and then um, have they been mostly ingenue roles? Yes, much? I mean that's what you were saying about my getting cast this year as as Sharon and writing. I did write about it in the Times, but the it, it's a role I've played many times, and I'm way too old for it. And um, yet it's a very important piece of theater, and I was really really pleased to see the reviews were off the charts, amazing. And you it wasn't for us as much as for the play. It's such right. an important play about you civil said rights. You um. No, go ahead. What were you saying about the play? No, no. The play is written by Yip Harburg and his his views about um, constitutional rights and civil rights in America. Um, he was a really, really strong uh, and outspoken um, uh, political person. Um, wrote Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? Um, he uh, wrote this beautiful fantasy that has an ingenue at the center, but they're Irish immigrants, and it's about immigrants coming to America and finding... Uh, the reprehensible sort of behaviors of the Jim Crow South and a, a leader that just openly says, no, you can't because you're, and, and my character says, because they're black, it makes no sense. And, and um, then the leprechaun who has followed me is losing his pot of gold, then his green, he's losing his green. So he's losing his green. I get very upset about the senator and how he's speaking, and I say, I wish you were black so that you could understand. It turns out I'm standing over the pot of gold, so the senator who's white turns black. So the leprechaun's losing his green. So everyone's losing their color, and the whole thing's ridiculous, really. It's, and that's Has this we, always been in Finian's rhyme? Yes. It, the whole point is okay. that our surfaces and being judged by our surfaces is is not only unconstitutional, it's actually just ridiculous. And this man is so smart, and he made a farce, a silly, light, seemingly light, but very, very pointed and strong statement. Okay. And I love it. And I think that I applied it, you know, I had to apply it to, to my own surface in some way, you know, and just like, I'm a storyteller, you know what I mean? I'm not, a, I'm not doing a, a movie anyway. I mean, I'm up there to tell a story about how people think, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and having a, 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 you know, what it is to have a human heart, you know, and just to be a community. Mm -hmm. Okay. Slash country. We're going to have to take a short break. Then we'll be <laughs> back with more with actress and singer and writer Melissa Errico. <laughs> Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy at the City University of New York, and I'm talking with singer, actress, writer Melissa Errico. You said that, you know, even when you're playing um, the ingenue roles, you try to bring some complexity to them. Well, I, I have to now. <laughs> I always did. I mean, I always loved the care. I love, I've always loved the characters that I've played, and I've always tried to understand them, whether it was in My Fair Lady or in High Society or a Dracula on Broadway or Amour. <laughs> Amour was a wonderful Broadway show that I did. But which you won a to Tony nomination, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was a beautiful, sad character. Um, she wasn't ingenue, but she was behind, uh, always behind uh, this, this sort of little glass window, living the wife of a lawyer, living um, a very unrealized life. And the play was about, um, uh, is based on a, a, a book called Le Passe Muraille, which means the man who walks through walls. And it's a Marcel Aimé's sort of short story that all the kids in France always read. It's like The Catcher in the Rye for Fr France. And uh, it's a common book. 
And uh, it was about a man who one day goes home and he lives a very ordinary life. He's a civil servant, sort of, it's like working at the post office or something. He, simple guy and everything's always ordinary. And one day he walks through walls. He just walks through the door and he doesn't know how he got inside his apartment. And it's all about, it's a surrealistic idea of just suddenly being boundaryless. And he has always loved that girl across the street. And it's, she picks up on this man and it's all about being trapped and so on. So I've always related to the, even if I'm given something a little far out like that, I've never just played it like, I'm pretty, I'm in the window. I need something, I'm sad, I want something. There's a, I put, so in, in that case, I felt a lot of sorrow for her um, and so on. So I've always found the, um, a way to relate beyond just, uh, like I said, falling in love at first sight, you know. Have you studied acting? Well, I went to Yale um, as an undergrad and I did study acting at Yale and then I spent my summer uh, between uh, junior and senior year at Oxford doing an acting program um, with the drama school mm -hmm. and um, a collaboration with Yale and Oxford called BADA. Um, and that's where I, st I did the, my first sort of acting studies. The, when I came, when I graduated as an undergrad, I then applied to the drama school and I had been writing a play. I was an art history major and I'd been writing a play about a, a painter and I did all the monologues from the from my play and I got into the Yale Drama School and at the very beginning of school I got cast as in My Fair Lady. Mm. So I dropped out. So I always felt like yes I have studied acting but I did not go to the drama school. And while I was in New York my entire career until he's gotten a bit ill, now I've had a coach named Harold Guskin. Okay. And he's a bit of a radical in New York and he wrote a book called How to Stop Acting. So in the end He's not really a technique guy as he is a man who wants you to um, uh, really understand, obviously, the research and the role and know your lines, but he wants you to be free. Okay. It's about, it's about a kind of study that then leads to a kind of a total freedom and trusting yourself. And it's taken me a long time because I was doing it with a nice voice, mm. saying it with a nice voice. <clears throat> he was like, what are you doing? Just say it. Right. Just talk to me. Right. So it it's, took me a long time to understand what he was saying. It was just to be, be, be. Is there a role that you would like to play that you haven't had a chance to play yet? Uh, well, there's all these superstitions in theater, so you mustn't say. Okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, would any, anyone have a part out there for... Um, Call me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there are, there are interesting roles out there, um, uh, and it's not like there's no parts for somebody in their 40s, but maybe Desiree in A Little Night Music is, some, is somebody. Um, and without giving away too many other titles, there are some, there are some characters who are in there, mm -hmm. sort of between I think, time and their life. I think about um, the mother's role in The Light in the Piazza, that Victoria Clark played, which I thought Yeah, was that's a big sing, but I think I can do it. Yeah, yeah. you need to have, I mean, she had a proper opera background. You know, yeah. it's interesting, musical theater people can, and I can sing it, but that's not a typical musical theater play slash yeah. role. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's a big musical undertaking. A lot of um, musical theater actors come up through sort of dancing and acting and an intellectual, almost British, a style, and then there's some who come through Juilliard, and they really come from the opera conservatories, mm -hmm. and then they go, I actually don't want to do art songs all the time in operas. I love musicals. So people come to musical theater from so many angles, and the Light in the Piazza really walked that Juilliard art songs, you know, more high, you need a big, beautiful operatic right. voice. So right. I, would, I would train hard for that part, yeah. and I would really give it the respect it deserves. But that's not your typical right. musical, you know, like King and I is a lot easier to sing. Yeah. Does, does television give women, and, which you have done, and movies as well, does it give actors uh, the opportunity to play more complex characters? I think so. Yeah. I think so. I should be so lucky to get it. I am auditioning for TV, and I think TV right now is just is exploding actually with with opportunity for women i'm sh and i think the women who are in la would say no it's not you know it's but the way we see it from you know from new york and from dealing with the canon of classical musicals a lot there seems to be so much opportunity um for and you have more um 
actors who at one point would not have thought about television. I'm a movie actor, I don't do TV, and now everybody's doing television. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it's happening in theater, too. People, there's a lot more demand for famous or television actors to be seen doing, um, you know, seen in person in general mm -hmm. every you know everybody's crisscrossing which is actually kind of exciting i do remember a time where people you had to choose la or new york it was like there was this right. like, like this wall between us so I, i'm excited about that and i do think um uh everybody crisscrossing is kind of okay it just makes it a little bit harder for people who are not the most famous people around to get access to work because a lot of super famous people who would never normally do TV, like you're saying, are, are happy to do it. So, um, so you also do recording work and you right. do concerts. Do you have a favorite medium? Um, uh, the, the least explored at the moment is is television. Um, so at the moment, I wouldn't say it's my. F I have I don't really have a perspective on my whole life, um, but I'm intrigued by the fact that there's these networks popping up all over the place, like Amazon has a network and Netflix. And uh, I'm interested to see what, what it's like to, to work so freely in TV and not have the pressure of um, what used to be like network TV had a certain format, whereas cable and people are much more artistic with, uh, te with the television stories that they're telling. So right now it's the least explored, so I'm very intrigued mm -hmm. by it. Mm -hmm. um, my, but my favorite thing is musicals. I mean, I've done them my whole life. I would say that if I were to close my eyes and tell my little girls what mommy always loved, you know, and if I held their hands and said what I found beautiful in life other than to love them, it was musicals. Yeah. I always loved musicals. I love singing for people. I, and I love being in a co theater company. I can't explain it. It's a, it's, it's a, my whole life I've always wanted to be in musicals. Mm -hmm. And I aspired to be on Broadway. I respected Broadway. Everyone who does it, I see them. I ran it. I saw Christine Ebersole it in the audience of Present Laughter last night. And for me, it's so exciting to see Kevin Klein up there and a Noel Coward play. Mm -hmm. And Christine Ebersole, this, who's starring in War Paint right now and uh, having a tremendous success, humbly sitting in the seats watching her peers. It's a beautiful community. It was interesting. And I think I've always felt that long before I was in it. It was interesting to me that Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, you know, who's known for his movies, said, and now he's in uh, Sunday in the Park with George, yeah. said it, that, that singing was really his true love. And I mean, did he say knew? that? Yes, he did. Oh, my God. And who knew? Who knew that Jake Gyllenhaal could really sing? I hear he's really good. Yeah, I hear he's really good, too. I can't wait to see it. I did Sunday at Kennedy Center. Um, and... Uh, I love that play. So I, when you have children, I don't always go right away to the things I've been in or know because I want to see something new just to make sure I don't miss it. I hear mm -hmm. Come From Away is unbelievable. Um, and I'm going to see that this week. I saw Present Laughter last night. There's so much that's good, but that's wonderful to hear. I'm really, I really want to see that. We talk about, you know, typecasting and pigeonholing before. The Broadway has shown some flexibility in recent years. I mean, Hamilton has blown the roof off of oh, cross-racial casting. So good. Spring Awakening and The Glass Menagerie have made history with featuring physically disabled actors and deaf actors, so oh. mm -hmm. this seems more openness. I know. As the world is, I don't know, the world seems to be going in two directions. It's like awful and scared, and the, the theater doesn't really seem to show that. Theater people are always pushing to open to op to, they just keep pushing. There's this wonderful movement called um, the Ghost Light Project, um, which is all about uh, uh, you know the community proclaiming um, and reminding itself and saying out loud, we are going to continue to push for everyone to feel there's a role for them here, um, and that the stories we tell will always be stories of all people. They will never. It's not you know going to, to. We are not going to narrow if the minds around possibly the country or now can or are tempted to narrow. It's not going to happen mm -hmm. in Times Square. So you've got about 58 seconds to tell <laughs> us what's next for you. <laughs> oh, the usual. The, the, I have a website, melissaerico.com. I'm always, I, I, Just send uh, them to the and, website. Go to Just the website. website. I mean, until, until a one defining play or the, you know, actors are always ready for the one beautiful play or character or television show to come along but I also write I have articles coming out and I have a concert every month and um, uh, at the Caramore at Birdland Jazz I sang at Carnegie Hall uh, two weeks ago with um, Michael Feinstein and I'm going to recreate those 
beautiful songs, but Judy Garland's and from the 40s and 50s that Michael Feinstein introduced me to this whole world. He is another national treasure, really, that man. And um, so I'm, I loved working with him, and so I booked another concert to, to sing that music again because it was so much fun. So, um, in addition so every being, month there's something I okay, sort of wonderful. author, as it were. And so in addition to being very talented, you've also been very lucky, you know, to get to yes. work steadily in Yes, you know what, I think areas. I've stayed flexible. Yeah. You know, I've had, you know, luckily this interview didn't go to all the hard times and the bad knocks and stuff. I've had plenty of those. But I, I, as a mom, I don't know if my kids are motivating me more or if it's just my nature. I am someone who stands back up. You know, I, I do believe that, um, you know, we, only, uh, we are only burdened by the things we carry along with us. You actually can drop stuff. Just drop it. Regrets, mistakes, mm -hmm. drop it and continue to be a good person. And it just d don't carry things. And so I think that I'm always open to something new because I am trying to get, I'm not, I'm not carrying with me a ton of, we all, have, we all have sorrows and mistakes, injuries, accidents, losses, bad luck. We dump all have the baggage. It. Dump, the dump baggage. it. Okay. Dump it. The right. actors are really good at dumping it. So if I, I may not be the most illustrious guest you've ever had, but that metaphor it works for anybody. Okay. Keep and on dumping that note, it. <laughs> Keep we're up. We're going to end this. <laughs> we're out of time. I want to thank Melissa Erico for joining me. You can catch up with her latest work at what's your oh melissaerico dot com e r r i c o okay for the City University of New York and one to one. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.